COVID-19 arriving into the UK has changed our lives dramatically, as we all know. Uh, lockdown life has had huge impacts on the way people work and live. But what are your rights and what could this mean for your finances? We decided to work on our partners to this Ask the Expert session to answer some of your questions around employment rights, personal finance, and how you can protect yourself and your business. We'll also look at what your rights about payments and what liabilities do you have. Joining me today on the panel from UK law firm Blake Morgan are Deborah Gers, who helps employers negotiate the tricky area of employment law, Manoj Sarch Patel from the corporate team, who helps companies with a range of corporate matters, including mergers and acquisitions, restructuring, etc. Dan Geddes, who specialises in restructuring, insolvency and commercial litigation, and Lisa Davies, a private client lawyer from Blake Morgan's succession and tax team, who advises clients on inheritance tax, wills and estate planning. From Charles Stanley Wealth Managers, I have Tom Miller, financial planner, helping his clients create a financial plan, advising on areas such as tax planning, wealth protection and inheritance tax. And lastly, Katie Tasker, who manages a client's investments to support their wider financial needs. The biggest change to people has been work. Um, so over to you first, Deborah. What are people's rights here? Many companies are asking employees to go back to work. Are they obliged to actually go back to work? As you'd imagine from an employment lawyer, I was going to say in my answer, it depends. Uh, the starting point is there are no changes to employment rights. So existing employment law is still applicable. So your right not to be unfairly dismissed, the right to not suffer um, discrimination, all of those are still in place. In the context of COVID-19, um, the issue, of course, is if you are returning to work, are you going to be returning to a safe workplace? And if you don't think it's safe, what's your remedy? So the guidance so far from the government has been returned to work if you can, then ideally stay working from home. So if you're in the um, environment where you are encouraged to go back to work, what can you do about it if you don't feel safe? Don't forget health and safety obligations. So an employer has to provide a safe workplace. Um, and for them now, what they would be looking at is complying with the government guidance on making workplaces secure. So there are eight separate guides and an employer needs to apply the right guide to that particular type of workplace. From the employee's perspective, there's been a long-standing right to refuse to work or stay away from the workplace or leave the workplace if they reasonably believe they are in um, a serious and imminent danger to their health. So applying that to the COVID context, if the employer has carried out all their health and safety obligations, if they've carried out the risk assessment and discussed it with the individual, is it reasonable for the employee not to go into work if requested? Um, and that will really depend on the individual. So if you're an individual classed as extremely vulnerable, so you have um, serious lung conditions such as cystic fibrosis, or you're pregnant with an underlying health condition, um, you actually can't go into work. So you, regardless of what your employer is saying, you can't go into work. If you're a vulnerable person, over 70, pregnant, but without an underlying health condition, really, um, the employer shouldn't, you be, shouldn't be asking you to go to work anyway. If you refuse to go to work, what risk are you under? So if you are 20, um, can drive to work, have no underlying health conditions, work in a part of the country where the rates of COVID-19 are now fairly low, so for instance in London, then arguably your risk of serious and imminent danger from COVID-19 is pretty low. Um, so it may not be reasonable for you to refuse to go into work. So if you were to refuse and were dismissed, the onus would be on you to show it was reasonably for you to be concerned about the serious and imminent danger. Having said that, Everyone is advising employees at the moment not to take those drastic steps because there's lots you can do to avoid putting an employee in a position of refusing to go into work. They can stay on furlough or be put on furlough. They can take holiday. They can be put on unpaid leave. They can, um, if the concern is about too many people in the workplace, can you stagger the work times? So really employers should be taking all those steps to try and deal with an employee's concerns about why they don't want to go to work. Another fan asked, 
how protected am I legally if I can't make full payments to things such as rent or direct debit due to being furloughed? And I'll hand this one over to Manoj. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, I think the first thing to say is that being on furlough doesn't automatically provide any sort of uh, legal defence uh, to all these matters. So you talk about uh, direct debits or rent payments. I mean, obviously, everybody will have different contractual arrangements, so I can only speak generally. But generally, my answer would be that uh, you ought to speak to, in the case of rent payments, your landlord. Uh, the government have encouraged landlords to be, shall we say, more generous uh, with their tenants. There are schemes in place uh, so that landlords can't evict people as quickly as perhaps they could have done uh, prior to this uh, pandemic. Um, and what you should do is, if you are struggling to pay your rent, is go and speak to your landlord. See if you can come to some accommodation, maybe stagger the uh, way in which rent is paid, maybe defer rent. What you shouldn't do is simply sit tight, do nothing, not pay your rent, and then say, oh, I'm, I'm on furlough, so not, none of this applies to me. So the key answer to, for, for me is early conversations. The same with direct debits. I was reading something recently. You know, most of us have got, if we were to ever study our bank statements, loads and loads of direct debits, perhaps, for things we don't even use. I mean, I've heard anecdotally that some of the TV companies like Virgin Sky, etc., are allowing people to su suspend their, um, uh, their, their subscriptions or to reduce their packages for this period um but don't uh, I, I mean i repeat you can't simply say oh i'm on furlough therefore i'm protected from 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 any claim so so go and speak to the people work out what you need if you genuinely can't afford um your rent uh, or to pay something go and speak to your landlord see what you can do as i say the government are encouraging landlords in particular uh to be more reasonable uh so as not to not to evict people for, for failure to pay rent um, talking of payments, obviously there are a lot of concerns about paying for mortgages. Um, should people be taking advantage of a mortgage holiday? And if they do, what are the implications? Yeah, again, I can only speak generally. I mean, everything will depend on each individual circumstances. Um, but actually, this morning, the government announced that they have encouraged or have asked banks to extend the uh, mortgage holiday scheme. Uh, and what it means in very simple terms, if you apply for that, and again, the key is you have to apply for it. It is not automatic. So if you feel you're going to struggle to pay your mortgage payments, then first place, uh, first port of call is contact your bank, uh, apply for a, a, a payment holiday. Um, and in effect, what that means is that your mortgage is deferred. Uh, the key being here is deferred. It's not cancelled. So for the period of your mortgage holiday, you, you don't pay the mortgage but you will then have to pay it later on. So I, I don't think it's, it's free money. So you certainly shouldn't, in my view, and it, it, in my view, you shouldn't take advantage of this if you, if you can pay your mortgage. Um, in extremis, if, you, if you're struggling to pay your mortgage, speak to your bank. And it's not just a simple holiday. There are other schemes available from the bank. So for example, if you've got a repayment mortgage, you may be able to switch it to an interest only mortgage for the period of the window. Um, if you can pay a proportion of your mortgage rather than the whole of the payment, then you may be able to get a deferral for the bit you can't pay. Uh, so uh, same as the previous um, question really, Matt, um, speak, speak to the bank. These facilities are available for, to people, uh, but I think my advice would be you should only perhaps use them if you need to, because it, it, is not, it is not free money. All it's doing is deferring the mortgage payments until a later date. As interest rates are currently low, is now a good time to look at my finances and investments? Um, thanks, Matt. Well, the extra amount of free time we all have at the moment, we are finding a lot of people reviewing their current financial situation. And given the current low interest rates, it might make you think twice about looking at your cash havens. And typically at the moment, you're seeing most high street banks paying around 0.1 interest on your savings. And there is even talk of negative interest rates, which is even more bad news for cash savers who have seen interest rates at these low levels for years. So for savers, kind of the prospects of negative interest rates is a huge problem as you'll see your cash eroded over time. And essentially, this is because banks are going to be charging you for looking at after your cash. So this once again poses a problem. And on the kind of um, on the mortgage side I touched upon, while the current interest climate for savings is not so appealing, no looking to get on the property ladder, it could be quite a beneficial time for them. And we've kind of seen the kind of property market, especially kind of London, maybe drop around 4% this year, what they're saying. Um, these low interest rates and cheap mortgages could mean a better time for people to get onto the property ladder. 
but those with existing mortgages, um, the lower interest rates will be cheaper on trackers, but if you have a fixed rate kind of mortgage, um, there should be no change there. So it kind of leads me on saying, what are your options for your savings? And while the interest rates with cash are very low, you do have some comfort that you know you'll get your money back and you can generally access this. It is safe. You, you can access cash within the short term. And looking on the flip side, your alternative option is to invest to hope for greater returns than you are staying in cash. But with this, you have got to accept some kind of risk and you might not get the money that you put back in. So if you're someone you're happy to accept a greater risk within your cash savings. And before thinking about how much to invest, it is important to consider why you invest in. So investing money is important to different people for different reasons. So I might be investing to save for a house. Um, some people might be investing to save towards their future in retirement. So before investing, it's always good to set up why you're investing, what your objectives are and set out a plan for yourself. And um, I'll pass over to my colleague, Katie, who will talk about a bit more about investing there. Yeah, so picking up on Tom's point, um, the one benefit of having cash savings is that there's zero risk, whereas with investments, you will always be introducing an element of risk to the uh, to your savings and to, to your life. Um, so what you have to consider here is that clearly for taking additional risk with investing in stock market or other forms of investment, you are then entering into the potential for greater return and greater reward. Now that does always come with the caveat that your money can go up in value just as well as it can go down in value and there's no guarantees when it comes to investing. Um, I think the first thing that we'd say is just have a think, are you comfortable with taking risk and how would you feel if you returned one day and you had 20% less than you put in at the start. Because the one thing with a bank account is at least you can be guaranteed that if you put that thousand pound in, that in six months time, that thousand pound will be there. And that's not the case always with investments. So we are finding that um, low interest rates tend to drive um, clients and individuals into taking risk and into the stock market to try and generate a better return. But just check first that you're comfortable with that risk that you're taking. And I'll hand back to Katie for this one. How is the crisis going to impact interest rates long term? And how will that have an impact on my savings? So if we go back to sort of the fundamentals of economics, interest rates are the tool which the Bank of England used to manage levels of inflation um, within an economy. Now, typically in a recession, which is being talked about what we're highly likely to enter, um, we barely see any inflation. You know, people don't have the same pet, uh, spending power um, and then they tend to save rather than try and spend their money. So we do see um, interest rates typically in a normal inf um, recession stay relatively low, um, which would possibly mean that coming up for savers or for those with mortgages, we could now see a relatively low interest rate environment for some time to come. And you therefore have to consider what that means for your savings and, and whether you continue to take this approach that you're happy with it in the bank because at least you know that it's safe. Now, the one thing I would say about this current crisis is this isn't really like a normal recession that we have experienced in the past. Um, we are talking about, and you'll probably hear on the news quite a bit, that we are expected to bounce back quite quickly from this. And certainly once the economy does get going on again, then there's quite a lot of sort of money been stored up that we haven't been able to spend for the past few months whilst we've been at home um, under this current lockdown period. So it may well be that in this crisis, um, the recession isn't as long as it has been, let's take, for example, back in 2008 and 2009. And therefore, you may get levels of inflation return sooner than we have seen in previous recessions. Now, one thing I would say is more recently, the Bank of England have been very, very conscious of the levels of debt within the economy. Certainly, if you look at what the governments have to, had to borrow in recent weeks to cover this crisis, um, the government itself is now looking at a huge, huge debt burden. Um, and so the Bank of England will bear in mind that you know, raising interest rates too quickly has a punitive effect on those that have high levels of debt. So I'd say you're probably looking at lower for longer interest rate environment. And therefore, if you need to assess your savings in the interim, um, I think you could probably be prepared that interest rates will remain low for some time.
And just one more case piece for you. Is now the right time to buy in certain markets? Um, what are the opportunities um, in the current markets? So the one thing we're always very wary of with investment managers is that when markets move as rapidly as they have done in the last two months, they defy all logic and reason. Um, so you'll find many people out there speculating and commentating on what happened and why it happened, but quite often there is no real reason. Um, and so what we try and say to investors is to stay calm and to wait for calm in the markets to be restored. You know, whilst the market is moving around by hundreds of points a day, um, you may think it's a good opportunity to get involved, but you could get caught out. You could buy on a down day or you could buy on an update. It, it's a flip of a coin at this point. So what we say is, and, and what this is very much followed by the Charles Sunny research team, is there will be opportunities along the way over the next few months where either good companies have had to take a short term hit or good companies are standing the test of time, the likes of technology and healthcare. And so watch out for those good opportunities. Um, if you are thinking of investing now, um, now is more the time than ever to be targeted with, with your approach. So a, a blanket, you know, I'm going to throw my money into a blanket basket of goods um, and, and leave it there um, might not be the best approach right now. It has to be very targeted and very gradual. Um, put your money in slowly. Um, don't put it all in day dot. Um, and what we would say is, if you look back at history, right, what might not always repeat itself, it does often rhyme. And if we look back at history, if you're patient, and if you're calm, and if you take good advice in this market, you can be rewarded in the long term. And Tom, back to you uh, again. I've got a fan question here. Will there be any changes to the ISAs, savings, trusts or pensions that I already have? Um, apart from what I touched on earlier, and thanks, Matt, apart from the savings rate, you might see your savings interest rates reduce. But in terms of kind of legislation, um, ISAs, pensions in wake of the COVID pandemic, there's been no real major changes there. Um, every tax year, the ISA allowance is reviewed, the pension allowances are reviewed. So at the moment, your current ISA allowance is 20,000 and you are able to contribute £40,000 into your pension each year, uh, but there are some caveats if you are a high earner there. And um, the pensions and ISAs do work differently in each of their unique set of rules, and they are both tax efficient ways to save for retirement. So as touched upon earlier, when about looking at your goals, why you're looking to invest, why you're looking to save, and the ISAs are one of the most flexible tax efficient savings plans available. They can be accessed at any time, and the pensions, you have to be 55. So it, it's what you're looking to save for, and what your long-term goals are because with a pension you do get that tax relief and if you are happy for the money to sit away for a number of years and access it to your 55 then it's a great vehicle and I think when you're looking at your personal finance situation now it's good to have a look at your various ISAs and pensions to make sure you are using those allowances because some of these allowances will be lost and back into kind of Katie's comments that there could be some opportunities to wrap your money in one of these vehicles and make the most tax efficient way of using your money. I suppose the other key worry for people uh, has been getting the virus themselves. Um, Lisa, what sort of protection can you put in place in case of illness? Yes, yeah, certainly people have been thinking a lot more about critical illness, um, even at a younger age, given the, the pandemic that we've been experiencing. Um, the advice we normally give people is to consider a lasting power of attorney. And this is advice we've been giving certainly the older sector of the population for many, many years, because with the onset of Alzheimer's, other forms of dementia and general fr um, frailty, it's important that you're able to delegate decision making powers to family members, trusted people. Um, however, that's equally valid for younger people if they go through a period of being unable to give instructions with respect to their health, welfare or finances. So there are two forms of powers of attorney one that deals with property and financial affairs, and the other which is completely separate and deals with health and welfare issues. And we would recommend that you make both. Uh, you can appoint the same people, very often, for example, uh, people appoint their children. Um, so you can appoint the same people as attorneys under both powers, but they do operate separately. The health and welfare power of attorney actually only comes into force, can only be used if the person who gave the, the power, the donor, loses mental capacity and is unable to make decisions for themselves. And of course, a classic example in the last few months would be being on a ventilator. You're obviously at that point unconscious, unable to communicate. Somebody needs to step in and look after things for you. 
the property and financial affairs power of attorney can be used at any time once it's been registered and can be very useful for people who still have complete mental capacity but perhaps are uh, physically incapacitated or indeed self-isolating. If you can't get out of the house, you can't go to the bank, you can't sign papers for yourself, then being able to delegate that to a trusted professional advisor or a family friend or, or family member would be extremely useful. And should the worst happen, what other things should people have in place? Well, the most obvious answer to that, of course, is a will. And we're still told that up to two thirds of the adult population in Great Britain doesn't have a will. Um, it's absolutely essential that people make a will if they're intending to leave assets to chosen family members or friends or charities or, or whoever they wish to, to leave their estate. You cannot rely on what's called the rules of intestacy. So that's where the law steps in. Somebody hasn't made a will and dies and the law decides who's going to inherit their estate you will not get the result that you want, almost invariably. Thanks, Lisa. Another fan has asked, how much is the inheritance tax limit now? I remember reading something about it being one million quid, is that right? Yes, indeed. The headline was a million pounds. Um, and that's absolutely right. The inheritance tax is the tax that uh, takes effect on death. The inheritance tax limit through a combination of tax reliefs and allowances available to married couples can be worth up to a million pounds um, for uh, couples in the UK, uh, married couples, couples and civil partnerships. Um, that's made up in effect of two different um, forms of, of allowance. The first is called the nil rate band and has been around for a very, very long time. That's the amount that each individual has available to them on their death to leave to anyone of their choosing without any tax ever being payable. And that's currently set at £325,000 per individual and has been fixed at that actually for a very, very long time. Uh, what did change some years ago was that if you didn't use your allowance when you died, so for example, the classic uh, case of leaving everything to your spouse when you die, all transfers between spouses are tax exempt. So if you're Bill Gates, there's no tax to pay at that point. Uh, if you leave your estate to your spouse, no tax allowance is used. You can now transfer that unused £325,000 to your surviving spouse, and they get double the allowance against their estate when they die. So that brings us up to 650000 then in 2015, a rather complicated, actually um, certainly more so than I think the government intended, uh, and a complicated relief was brought in called the residence nil rate band. And this attaches just to your main residence, to your home, and is an additional um, £175,000 per person. Again, it can be transferred if not used. So that gives you £350,000 per couple. When you add that to the 650000 there's your headline million pound tax saving. What I would say is that the rules around being able to claim the residence nil rate band are deceptively difficult. Um, it, it sounds relatively straightforward till you start to dig into the detail, but in broad strokes, it has to be a relief that's set against the value of your main property. You have to leave it to children or grandchildren, and it has to be what's called closely inherited. So they have to inherit immediately on your death. And that causes some problems with tax planning why you would need professional advice, because a lot of people try to delay children, particularly younger children or grandchildren from inheriting large sums by saying uh, not to inherit until they're 21 or 25. And that sort of age contingency can frustrate the application of this, uh, this tax relief. There are ways to mitigate inheritance tax. Again, Tom, uh, in his role, um, would you be able to give an advice on ways to do that? Yeah, um, thanks, Matt. Um, typically, we look, there's real five main ways to kind of reduce or mitigate inheritance tax, and they're all based on anyone's kind of personal circumstances. And the easiest one is to spend more. And I don't know about you, that's finding that very difficult at the moment. Um, you can't go out. So it's increasing your expenditure that can help reduce your estate. But as long as you're not buying assets that stay in your estate, like cars, antiques, for example. And you do have various, secondly, um, you have various exemptions and allowances. So um, you can give away surplus income or limited amounts from capital every year without inheritance tax. So you can make a gift up to £3,000 per year. And you get various allowances when you make gifts to children or grandchildren when they get married. And kind of touching on what Lisa said, you can just make outright gifts. So you can gift money away, which can reduce your estate. And some gifts are exempt immediately and some are exempt after seven years. And if you put some cash, you can also put some cash property or investments into a trust and which you, your spouse or none of your children under 18 can benefit from. 
and they are no longer usually part of your estate, but it's more, more complicated there. And another benefit is you can also leave any money to charity. And if you leave at least 10% of your estate to charity in your will, um, the rate of inheritance tax reduces down from 40 to 36%. And um, we, we kind of touched on how you can protect your wealth with insurance earlier. And um, if you take out a life insurance policy, you can pay the whole amount of the inheritance tax due. So for example, if your inheritance tax due was 200,000 pounds, you could set up a life policy for that to pay that amount. So your family wouldn't need to sell any of your assets. And also a kind of bit of planning we do at Charles Stanley is um, business relief. So you can invest in the AIM market, for example. And if you hold that for two years, those stocks and shares, they're exempt from inheritance tax as long as they're still held at your time of death. But with any planning, there's you need to, have to think about your current situation. And that's looking at how much you can afford to give away, invest without affecting your income and capital needs given the kind of rising costs of future care, you wanna make sure that, okay, are you okay before helping out your children? So that if it gets down to 30 years, you're not having to call on your children to ask them for a helping hand with the rising costs of care home. And on that, on health, it's if you are gonna give some money away, will you likely live the seven years and making sure that there's no inheritance tax there? And it's also the, the big one at the moment is, do you wanna help out your children now or leave a legacy. So it's while in your lifetime, you can see them benefit from your funds, or you're happy to kind of spend as much as possible. And if they get something, it's good for them. And, um, and it's also the control that goes back to the trust aspect of it is that if you want control about giving your money, you just gift right away. So you give money, give money to your children for a property, or you can give some money in trust, which will say, okay, I don't want them to have it until they're 18, for example. So how much control you have over the asset is important. But there's lots of different kind of avenues you can go down that matters on each, each financial situation. And some people won't be affected at all. You might have that million pounds. But if you are over that, there are various different avenues you can go down. That's great. Thanks, Tom. And back to Manoj for this question. Uh, a few friends of business owners. How can they protect their businesses? Yeah, th thanks, Matt. Um... I mean, the first thing to say is that the government's intervention here is, is, is unprecedented. I mean, we use words like unprecedented and unique and, and whatever a lot, but I mean, this is extraordinary what the government has put in place. And I would say to the fans of the, the questioner, business owners, don't bury your head in the sand. Um, Rishi Shunat, this, the Chancellor, said, look, we won't be able to save every single business, but the package and the measures that have been put in place um, would, would simply have been unimaginable six months ago, three months ago. Uh, so we've talked a bit in the employment context about furlough and the fact that the government is currently, in effect, underwriting the salaries of, of, of millions. I think I've heard eight, 10 million people in the country. So, so employers should, first of all, businesses should, first of all, look at whether they can take advantage of the furlough scheme. And, and put their, or I think the coronavirus, coronavirus job retention scheme, to give it its correct name, but to, to see if their employees can be temporarily furloughed uh, with a view to then claiming 80% uh, of their salary up to a cap of £2,500 per month back from the government. And again, that scheme has been extended. It was initially for three months. Uh, we don't have the detail of the, of the second extension, but it is, it is likely to continue uh, for some time. Then, of course, um, are, uh, are the, is the support that the government has encouraged the banks to provide. So there are, there are a series of business loans now, uh, again, um, being underwritten by the government, uh, which businesses should, 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 if they can, avail themselves of. Um, and it's difficult to provide a specific answer here because it depends on the size and scale of the business as to what loans are available. But again, you know, do go and speak to your bank, see what's available for your type of business and, and, and make sure you make sure you apply for those in good time. Um, and then lastly, I think I'd say on this is the payments to the government itself. So tax, for example, VAT, um, all of all of those with application can be deferred presently. Now, again, a bit like the answer I gave on on individual mortgages earlier in the session, um, it's not automatic and what, what it's doing is deferring, not cancelling the payment, but certainly that should help most businesses with cash flow uh, where, you know, right at the moment, I guess most businesses are, are trying to preserve cash and you know, deferring their tax bills, their VAT bills, 
um, et cetera, um, is, is a very good way of, of preserving cash. So there's lots out there, and I can understand it's probably maybe confusing, uh, but you know, speak to your banks, speak to your advisors, uh, and, and, and I repeat, don't bury your head in the sand, see what's available and see what can be done to protect your business. Because the, the, the point of this is, is we're hoping, and we're all keeping everything crossed, of course, that this is short term in the grand scheme of things. This is not a hopefully a, you know, a five year process that within six months, within a year, we should be back on our feet. And, and you, you know, you've got to do all you can to protect your business in that period uh, and hope it can come through the other side. Another question that came in, uh, how can I protect my business uh, from a potential lack of payment from third parties uh, caused by the lockdown? I'll hand this question over to Dan, if that's all right. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Great to meet you. Um, as an insolvency lawyer, I often find myself sounding very negative, and I'm afraid I have to start this answer with a negative uh, uh, vibe. Um, most experts are saying we're heading for a deep recession, and in, a, in, a, in any recession, businesses can expect uh, some, sometimes many of their debts not to be paid on time and sometimes not to be paid at all. So first point to make really is, can you completely immunize your business from bad debt? Well, unless you don't grant any credit whatsoever and receive payment for everything in advance, the answer is probably no. Um, what difference has coronavirus made? Well, we've seen all sorts of measures introduced in relation to people's ability to pay their debt. Um, unfortunately, for the person who's asked this question, um, those measures are almost all about protecting the person who owes the debt, the debtor, not the person to whom the debt is owed, the creditor. Um, for example, landlords are not able to forfeit leases at the moment, except under um, uh, unusual circumstances. They're not allowed to repossess goods on the, on the premises. Um, there's a bill going through Parliament at the moment, which is likely to become law, that, that means that um, people owed money cannot use the insolvency process to push a debtor into, into insolvency. So lots of protection for people who owe debts, not so much protection for people who are owed the debts. And whilst few people would argue that protection is a, is a good thing, the, the, the effect of this protection sometimes just means that the financial difficulties are just passed down the chain rather than what, one person not having a problem, the person who the money is owed to has a problem instead. So I've spoken about what they can't do. That wasn't the question. The question is how, how can they protect um, themselves from lack of payment? And really, in the absence of any legal measures, all I can really give are, are, are practical suggestions on, on how to manage um, debt in, 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 the current, uh, in the current climate. These are comments really that I think would have applied whether or not we were in the middle of a pandemic, but perhaps even more relevant now. Things like, um, who in your business is, is responsible for collecting and monitoring your debt? Um, whoever that is, do they have the resources they need to really actively monitor, to get in touch with customers on a regular basis and to check that they're, they're going to pay on time? And if not, why not? Um, that idea of knowing your customer is absolutely critical at the moment. For, you know, if, if, for example, you're speaking to your customer regularly, they mention that they're about to receive a business interruption loan. If, if you know that, you know when it's coming in, you know when to start um, pestering for your, your bill to be paid. Um, what else? Can you be a bit creative or flexible on your payment terms? Um, rather than just demanding payment the moment it falls due, can you, can you work with your customer to, to find a way that works for both of you? Um, there's lots of talk in the landlord and tenant sector at the moment about landlords having to move from collecting rent on, on the quarter date, which is the, the, the typical way that rent's paid, especially in the, the retail world, um, to maybe some sort of turnover-based rent. So it's acknowledging that the tenant can't necessarily always afford to pay exactly what they had agreed to pay and, and that it needs to be based on their income. Can you adopt a, a solution like that with your customers? Um, are you a provider of goods? If you're a provider of goods, what does your documentation look like? Is it up to scratch? Uh, do you have a retention of title clause in your documentation, which means that if your customer can't pay for their goods, can, can you at least um, enter their premises and get your goods back? You know, you'd rather have cash, but it's better to have your goods than, than nothing. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Dan. And I'll direct this next question to you as well. Another fan question. Um, as a director, how liable am I if I'm unable to make sufficient payments to suppliers and I don't qualify to help from the government? 
Yeah, this is a really topical question at the moment. Um, uh, really, uh, going back to basics, um, if you um, if a company has incurred a debt, um, law says that it's the company that owes the, de the debt, not the director. So your starting point is you're as a director, you're not personally liable. Um, that's what limited liability um, means, and that's why most people who choose to trade through a limited company do so. Um, that doesn't mean that directors are completely immune from personal liability, which is why it's a good question. Um, probably the, the main way in which someone can take on a personal liability is if they've personally guaranteed a company's debts. Um, most of the time, if a director's done that, they will be perfectly well aware of it. Usually they'll have given a guarantee, for example, to a bank or maybe a supplier. Um, however, I've seen quite a lot of examples, particularly in the construction trade, where directors have unwittingly given a guarantee, for example, to their, their building supplier, because there's a, there's a line at the bottom of their credit application forms saying that, they, that they've given a guarantee. So first point to note is check, check the paperwork, check you haven't given a guarantee. Um, aside from guarantees, probably the main thing to talk about here is, is wrongful trading, also known as trading whilst insolvent. Um, if a director um, uh, racks up debts um, on behalf of its company um, recklessly, continues to trade at a time when really they know or they ought to know that the company is bound to go into liquidation, then they can find themselves personally liable for some of the company's debts in, in those circumstances. Um, it's quite a complicated area. We could spend all day on it. I won't do that. But um, the, the, the simple message here is if, if you are in any doubt as to whether you, your company is going to be able to continue, take regular advice and act on it. Um, take advice from your accountant on what the accounts are saying. Uh, take advice from your lawyer on what that means for you personally and keep on doing so. Uh, there, there really is no substitute for that. And that is uh, uh, taking advice and acting on it is a defense to a wrongful trading claim. Um, there's a lot of excitement in my industry at the moment because one of the measures coming through in this bill um, going through Parliament that I mentioned earlier is that these wrongful trading laws are going to be relaxed um, because the government doesn't want people giving up on their business in, for fear of incurring a personal liability. Um, that's great news and I think we can all take comfort from that, but it doesn't mean that, that people, directors shouldn't be taking regular advice. There are, there are other ways in which they can find themselves personally liable. There are other duties that they owe to the company. And please do continue to take advice, continue to follow it. And hopefully that way you can, you can keep some peace of mind. Um, one last question for you all. Uh, what have your clients been asking that we should all be considering at the moment or thinking about? Right, um, well, thanks Matt. I think there were, a two particular issues in the employment context. So one um, with regard to the extension of the furlough scheme. So that comfort is there in that the scheme will be extended to the end of October. But obviously we know that there are going to be changes from the 1st of August. And one of those is an employer contribution to the level of wages. So employers will have to start contributing to those wages. And depending on the sector that you're in, um, if you're in something like hospitality and have no prospect of opening for months, you're not generating any income. So even a very low percentage of contribution um, is, is going to help you. you. You just don't have the money to make any contribution. So lots of our questions now um, relate to the return to work. How can you do that safely, which we've already looked at? And then, uh, unfortunately, the furlough scheme isn't going to be helping us long term. We are going to have to think about redundancy. So we've already seen lots of, you know, very high profile organisations um, making that decision. So in spite of the furlough scheme, it's not going to be able to save a lot of these jobs. So employers are increasingly looking at um, starting redundancy processes, unfortunately, depending on the sector. Thanks, Deborah. And over to you, Manoj. Yeah, so most of my corporate clients are, are looking at how they can shore up their balance sheet in this uh, in this period. Uh, we've already talked about on this call about preserving cash, and uh, a lot of the answers given by my colleagues here will would help do that. Uh, so I, I think the questions that I'm getting are around, you know, what what help is available, uh, which is outside of the normal help available in, in normal times. So you know, Deborah's just talked about the um, the furlough scheme. Uh, so we're getting a lot of inquiries about that. 
we're getting inquiries around the uh, business loans that are that are available again some of these especially at the uh, at the higher end i think we've just done one in the hundreds of millions of pounds for a, for a client uh, in the in the, the the ones in the higher end uh, are complex uh, and require require detailed legal advice uh, um, so we're getting inquiries uh, from some of our uh, larger clients uh, around those around those loan schemes but it's uh, it is about you know what's available right now to ensure that uh, business could protect themselves to ride out this storm. Perfect. And Dan, your views? Yeah, I suppose you could divide um, uh, the, the main queries I've been receiving into two camps. One is um, I'm owed money by a company. They've gone very quiet on me. I think they're going bust. What can I do? And the other is I think my business might be going bust. What should I do? Um, the answer to both questions is is probably too long to to to, to go into now. Um, well, but really, I think the main point, especially on from those who are in a supply chain and, and and who are owed money by by somebody else who's gone quiet on them, um, is really to repeat the point I made before about retention of title. Um, if if you if you can't get cash from someone um, uh, through no fault of their own, just because they simply can't, can you somehow? Uh, is there an, another way of improving your position? Um, and, and trying to get your, your goods back um, is quite often the only way of improving your position. Thanks, Dan. And over to you, Lisa. Yeah, the main um, spike that we've had in inquiries has perhaps not unsurprisingly been in, in wills. Um, I mean, very sadly, mortality has been the headline in the news every single day for months. Um, we never thought we'd live forever, but I think people not only are a little bit more focused on that at the moment, but also have, as I think Tom mentioned before, a little bit more time to devote to thinking about what they'd like to do with their estate, who they'd like to see benefit and taking the right advice. So I would urge people to make the most of this opportunity to get a will in place if they haven't got one already. Um, and actually, even if they do have one, make sure it's up to date and reviewed. Uh, it's not a once forever, put it in a drawer and forget about it activity. You make a will, they do go out of date. And that's because your circumstances change financially, to do with your family, but also actually the law changes. And there may well be things to do with tax or otherwise that you're unaware of that will have an impact on the will you already drafted. So you do need to take advice, make sure that what you have is fit for purpose. And if you're one of those two thirds of UK adults who doesn't have a will at all, now really is the time. Thanks, Lisa. That was really interesting. Um, from a financial planning perspective, I'll just hand over to Tom to start with. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, a lot of clients have been calling us up asking, are my finances okay? Am I on track? Because a, a lot of people are looking to retire around about now. And it's that kind of worry is, can I retire now? Or do I need to kind of delay that for a couple of years? And we always say, go back to that financial plan. What are you looking to do? How much do you need? And are you still on track? So as Lisa was saying, it's good to look at that financial position now and people have time. So it's thinking about exactly what you want to do, what you want to do with your life, what you need to spend and seeing if you are okay or you do have to work for a few years. Because there are some times that we just say to clients is this will have, this will have impact their investments. You may have to delay retirement or you might be in a position where you could you're enjoying the kind of more time at home more time with the children and you want to kind of give up work potentially and you might have enough money to do that and that's all part of kind of the financial plan that we do to see if that is that kind of yes you can quit now but it's also a time to kind of look at your investments and pensions to make sure they are appropriate for your level of risk because there is a lot of market uncertainty at the moment and you've got to be happy with the kind of risk you're taking Great, thanks, Tom. And lastly, Katie, just to get your views. Yeah, building on exactly what Tom just said, most of the inquiries we have been getting is about level of risk within the portfolio. When we take clients on, um, we ask them a question about their capacity for risk and how they would feel comfortable in certain market environments. And those market environments are normally quite extreme, like 20% drops, 30% drops. And, and to be honest, they're not experienced very often. And this is may well be the first time a lot of my clients have, or a lot of people investing have experienced such a drop and so it's the first time it really tests those answers that clients have given um, and so now would be a good time to perhaps contact your investment manager or reassess your investments and think okay am I entirely happy with the level of risk 
that I'm taking. And it, it could go both ways. You know, has, has the recent market drop largely un, unfazed you? And therefore, could you up the risk in the portfolio? Or has it really frightened you and given you sleepless nights? And if that's the case, you probably need to reduce the risk in the portfolio. So yeah, just an assessment of risk that you're taking with your investment and your financial strategy.